In 1939, war erupted in Europe between the Allied nations and the Axis nations. The major Allied countries were China, France, England, the Soviet Union, and Poland. They were joined by the United States in 1942 after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. The major Axis countries were Italy, Germany, and Japan. The majority of the battles were happening in the Pacific between China and Japan, as well as in Europe with France, England, the Soviet Union, and Poland fighting Germany and Italy. There was also major fighting in northern Africa between the colonies of the European powers. At the beginning of the war, the Western Front in Europe was being devastated by Germany's armored battalions of panzer tanks. Within the first year, France fell to the German army and was under the control of the German government. The Eastern Front was established in Europe in 1941 when Germany invaded the Soviet Union, violating their treaty of non-aggression. With the creation of the Eastern Front, troops were taken away from the Western Front to fight against the Soviet Union. The Western Front was now between England and Germany. To help England stave off the Nazi invasion, the United States enacted two economic plans to help Great Britain. The policies were cash and carry, and its eventual replacement, the Lend-Lease Act. Both of these policies allowed the United States to support the Allied cause without actually entering the war. These policies went all the way until 1942, when the Japanese bombed the naval base at Pearl Harbor in retaliation for an economic embargo that the U.S. placed on the island nation. After the attack by Japanese kamikaze bombers, the United States entered the war against Japan. Due to treaties between the Axis nations, the U.S. was soon at war against Germany, Italy, and their African colonies as well. The American forces went to fight in the Pacific against the Japanese, who were the majority of the reason that they were in the war. But they also fought on the Western Front in Europe. They had very few battles in Western, on the Western Front before June 6, 1944, and were mainly used as support for the British forces. This changed in 1943 when Operation Overload was approved by the Allied Joint Chiefs of Staff. Operation Overload was a multiple-year-long plan whose target was to free France from German control. The first step in this operation was the storming of the beaches in Normandy, France by British, American, and Canadian forces. This step was codenamed Operation Neptune and was originally set for June 5, 1944, but was moved back to June 6, 1944 because of poor weather. Operation Neptune was to play out like this. In order to make a beachhead in France, troops would sail across the English Channel to the 21-mile-long sandy beaches at Normandy. Once there, they would set up five ports for transporting supplies across the English Channel in the future. The ports were codenamed Juno, Omaha, Sword, Gold, and Utah. The two westernmost ports were to be taken by the American forces, and the other three would be taken by a combination of Canadian and British forces. To make sure that German forces stationed in Germany didn't know where and when the attack was going to take place, the Allied forces came up with Operation Fortitude. This operation consisted of diversionary stationing of Allied troops in England, Northern Europe, and Northern Africa to deceive the German High Command into thinking the attack was going to happen in a different place. This worked very well considering it tricked the German High Command into thinking that the attack was going to happen in Norway due to Fortitude North. This diversionary tactic worked well even after the attack at Normandy, because it tricked the German High Command into thinking the attacks at Normandy were a diversionary attack for a greater assault in Northern Europe. The way that they achieved this deceit was by creating inflatable field forces that made it seem to airplanes flying above that there were major troop buildups everywhere except southern England around Portsmouth. They would move these armies around during the night and make fake tire tracks for the tanks and other vehicles to make it look as if the forces were actually moving. When June 5, 1944 came along, the weather was terrible and it was obvious that the attack would have to be postponed. They decided to leave it to the next night knowing full well that if the attack didn't happen by June 6, 1944, it would be another month until it could be attempted again. When June 6 came around, the weather was just as bad as it was the night before. Not wanting to wait another month, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, along with the rest of the members of the Trident Conference, decided to go along with the invasion, even in the poor weather. The cooperation of the American military during the invasion was caused in major part by the political and economic ties that America had to the Allied countries of Western Europe. They knew that if someone didn't help the Allied nations during the war, they would lose all of the economic investment of the Lend-Lease Act if Britain fell. Also, they were losing merchant ships to German vessels. They also put economic sanctions on the Axis nations of Germany and Japan, which alienated America from them. 
Politically, they went to war because of national outrage over the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, as well as poor political relations with the Axis powers over the Economic Embargo and Lend-Lease Act. The invasion is still considered to this day the largest amphibious invasion to ever have taken place. The invasion of D-Day lasted until June 11, 1944, but Operation Neptune lasted until July 4, 1944, with over one million men transported to France over the month-long operation. During the, four, the first days of Operation Neptune, over 400,000 people were killed. Approximately 209,000 of these men were Allied troops, and approximately 200,000 were Axis. Operation Neptune majorly consisted of airstrikes, paratroopers, and an amphibious assault. Even in the low visibility, airstrikes were vital to this operation. While the beachheads were being set up, they were very vulnerable and therefore needed someone to ensure that they could set up the beachheads without being attacked. This is where the airstrikes were so successful. They flew further into enemy territory and took out strategic targets such as roadways, railroads, and bridges. They also dropped paratroopers at specific points westward and eastward of the beaches to secure major roadways or destroy targets such as anti-air batteries or bridges. Over 13,000 American paratroopers took part in the invasion. Due to poor weather, many paratroopers were dropped far away from their intended landing zones, putting them behind schedule. Many paratroopers were killed when dropping because of faulty parachutes or flooded marshes in which they were dropped. The majority of the paratroopers were dropped between the morning hours of 12.15 a.m. and 2.30 a.m. Men also arrived behind enemy lines by use of gliders. They arrived around 4 a.m. and were used to reinforce the paratroopers who had been fighting for the past three hours. By the end of the first day, only one-third of the paratroopers that were going to enter this battle were deployed. Their first job was successful because they destroyed major military targets as well as caused mass confusion for the German army due to the widespread dispersal of the American and British paratroopers. Once the paratroopers, gliders, and planes had destroyed major targets and drastically slowed the ability of the German army to react, the amphibious assault began. It consisted of a large force of British, Canadian, and American forces being transported from Allied battleships to the Normandy beaches by armed troop transport. The American military focused on Utah and Omaha beaches. The American forces first arrived at Utah at 6.30 a.m., but arrived 2,000 yards south of their intended landing zone due to the strong currents, which was part of the poor weather that caused them to postpone the operation on the 5th. Instead of travel the 2,000 yards to their intended starting point, the commanding officer on the scene, Theodore Roosevelt Jr., ordered that they start the assault right there. He then radioed back and ordered more rerouting of troops coming in behind them. The initial wave of men were followed by tanks and engineers. By 9 a.m. the same morning, the men exited the beach and started to head forward, attempting to clear the area of German soldiers. They fought for the rest of the day with the German 919th Grenadier Regiment. By noontime, they were able to disable the major strong point, which was 1,300 yards south of their original position. At the day's end, the soldiers of Utah Beach were unable to complete their tasks mainly because they arrived too far south of the beach, though they did get 21,000 men into France with only 1,197 casualties. Further east was Omaha Beach, which was the most heavily defended beach of all. It was assigned to the 1st and 29th Infantry Divisions and faced the entire 352nd German Division rather than the expected single regiment. The violent seas caused the landing boats to veer off their intended position. As a result, the bombers waited longer to attack the beaches for fear of hitting American soldiers. This meant that when the men arrived on the beach, many of the beach obstacles were still undamaged. Many of the landing crafts ran into sandbars before getting to the beach, forcing men to wade through five-foot-high waters for 50 to 100 yards while under fire. While trying to get tanks and armored divisions onto the shore, 27 of the 32 tanks sank with the loss of 33 crew members. The majority of the tanks that did make it to the beach were disabled on the beach and were used for cover fire until their ammunition ran out. The major problem for the landing party at Omaha was that they were forced to sustain fire from the cliffs above at times and at times had to halt the further landing of vehicles because the beach was still full of obstacles that disabled them. By late morning, there were more than 2,000 casualties and only 600 men had left the beach and reached higher ground. The American forces finally were able to move past the beach in the afternoon once the German army started to run out of it. Once the beachheads were established, the Allies were able to ferry in supplies and men into northwestern France. By the end of Operation Neptune, they had ferried in over one million men and thousands of pounds of supplies. Once they had a foothold in France as well as weapons and soldiers, they proceeded to invigorate the Western Front and take back France. The rest of Operation Overload involved the push eastward of Allied forces on the Western Front. 
It involved the liberation of France on August 25, 1944, the Battle of the Bulge, which lasted from December of 1944 to January of 1945, and ended with the Allied capture of Berlin on May 8, 1945. It just goes to show you that D-Day was the turning point in the European theater that it has always been made out to be.